All right, hey guys, welcome back. Um, Will Tipton here, and today we're going to do our our first programming in the IPython environment. So uh, I'm picking up right where I left off in the last video, but if it's been some time for you, go ahead and pull up your IPython notebook and let's get started. So as I as I briefly mentioned at the end of the the last video, uh, essentially the idea here is that we can type in commands or code and the notebook will evaluate those commands and give us some results. So in particular here I typed 5 plus 4 and it says 9. Um, you can also put more than one command uh, on each line so I say you know, 2 plus 3 and then I can either click run or to evaluate the cell I can go I can type control enter or shift enter also but Okay, so I put two commands in the sand cell, and then I ran it, and it says 5. So 5 is, is 2 plus 3, <laughs> but it's not 5 plus 4. All right, so the idea here is that the output is actually the, the last command in the cell. So if I put a variety of things in here, it's going to print out the last one. Okay. So uh, I guess so let's just get started. So as I mentioned, uh, I'm not going to assume any sort of programming background. So I'm going to go really slowly and try to explain everything that I'm doing. You know, so if you have any questions, please please do let me know. It's definitely best to, you know, make sure you understand everything along the way because we are going to get uh, more complicated fairly quickly. So best not to get behind early. So there's no reason to let's see leave those additions there. So I'm going to delete them. So in addition to commands, uh, other things that we can type are comments. So Comments, uh, you know, something like, you know, well, two plus three is a command that's actually going to be evaluated. But if I just want to write some some English text that I want the computer to ignore, then I can type a command sign and then write English text, so the computer doesn't read this. So comments are very useful in in programming, so that you can, you know, so you can write code and then when you come back later, you can read your comments to understand what the code is actually doing. <laughs> it turns out that a, a large part of computer science, or, or the hard part of, of software development, is often reading a uh, writing code, not that works the first time, but that makes sense when you come back and look at it six months later, or when your coworker comes back and looks at it, or whatever. Um, so, so any English text following a pound sign is a comment. And we'll make you know copious use of comments in order to write you know, well-documented programs. Okay, so I mentioned yesterday, or earlier, uh, a bit about libraries. So essentially libraries give us extra functionality. Uh, so we don't want to do everything from scratch, so we're going to use some pre-written functionality to make our lives easier. So the first thing we need to do is to tell our IPython notebook that we want to import that functionality. So there's there's tons of different uh, you know functionality out there. We don't want access to all of them. We need to tell the computer which ones we do want access to. So we're going to import some libraries. The way we do that is with the import command. So we're going to import. Uh, so the OS library gives us access to some operating system functions. The uh, I already mentioned the the poker eval library, and for cleanliness. I'll just add it to this top one, get rid of it down here. And then thirdly, there's this sort of special command, uh, percent sign pylab inline, that uh, it isn't actually a, it's not actually a Python command. The fact that it starts out with this percent sign means that it's actually an IPython command, right? So the IPython will see this and it, and it won't actually run this line as, as Python code. Um, but basically, what this does is it, it imports some more libraries. Okay, so I'll, I'll run that cell, and it prints out this statement populating the interactive namespace from NumPy and Matplotlib. So Matplotlib is a, a plotting library that lets us make graphs, and NumPy or NumPy maybe, uh, I guess it's short for numerical Python. It lets us do some some math operations quickly. So the second thing I want to do uh, is I want to make uh, I basically want to set this up to make easy use of the poker eval library. So most of the poker eval functions are made available to us through an object. So let me just write this and then we'll say a bit more about what it is. So say PE equals poker eval dot poke 
that capital of poker eval with some parentheses. So some explanation. So this is a statement, this thing that I'm highlighting here, poker eval dot poker eval. What it's doing is it's saying that inside the poker eval library that we imported, there's some function uh, called poker eval with caps. And this function, uh, a function is basically something that takes some inputs and it gives some outputs. So the inputs go inside the parentheses. So actually this function has no inputs, uh, but nonetheless, it produces an output and we're going to assign that output to a variable called PE. Okay, so a bunch of stuff has happened here, and if you're not if you're not familiar with computer programming, if you are, this might be too slow, but if but if not, a lot of things just happened. Okay, so basically we called a function. We have called a function from the poker eval library, and we assign the result to PE. So a single equals, a single equals sign is assignment. It represents assignment. Later, we're going to want to test if two things are equal. Um, so that's obviously a, a very common mathematical thing to want to do, test if two things are equal. And a, a different operator is used. Okay. So the single equal sign does not test for equality. It's for assignment. So basically, the things on the right are stored in the things on the left. So PE is a variable that takes the value of the output of this function. Okay, probably enough about that for now. Another thing to note is something about IPython. Uh, it makes it really easy to figure out what functions do. So in particular, if we just type poker eval dot poker eval, which is the name of this function, and a question mark, and then we run this cell, some documentation pops up. So let's see exactly what this function does. So first of all, uh, it, it tells us what this is. It says it has type class object, and I'll say more about what classes are later. Don't worry about it right now. But the big idea uh, is that this thing is sort of an equity calculator, and it works as follows. Basically, it's going to let us, uh, as it says, evaluate the strength of a poker hand for a given poker variant. Uh, hold them, of course, for us. And when we talk to it, we're going to have to give it things like hands and boards. Um, and both hands and boards are a list of cards. And it says we can express cards as either numbers or strings. And so this table gives us the relationship between the, the numerical relationship of a card and the string. Uh, string basically means text. Uh, so the numeric res representation of a card or the, or the text representation. So it's pretty straightforward, I think. The two of hearts is zero, the three of hearts is one, and so on. Okay. So the important point here is that we can access documentation about functions in IPython uh, with use it with a question mark. Okay, so now let's let's do a couple useful assignments. So I said we define this PE thing as poker eval dot poker eval, and the fact is, in the future, every time when we use PE, we could type. Uh, this whole thing, but P is shorter, and we're going to be using it a decent bit. Uh, P is a decent uh, component of our project, so just being able to type PE instead of typing this whole thing is it's just for convenience, essentially. Okay, so let's type some other things that are going to be useful for convenience. Let's make a new variable. Uh, I've mentioned new variables, but basically they're just names for things. Um, so we're going to make a new variable called numcards, and we're going to set it equal to 52. Uh, num ranks, what's that, 13, num suits is 4, uh, num hands is uh, 13, 26. So I think these are pretty straightforward. This num hands, um, that's the total number of hold'em hand combinations possible. Uh, it's, uh, it's n choose k, 52, 2. So I can I can put a comment here to make sure I know what I'm doing, uh, define some useful constants. And I'll, I'll click Save. You should, of course, save regularly. OK, so I, I mentioned earlier that one of the important things when you do any programming is to make sure that you write code that makes sense, not only right now, but also you know, six months from now when you come back and look at it. Uh, the fact is that you know, the requirements of code, what you want to do, 
always change over time, and you have to expect that and plan for it. And what that means um, is that later you're going to have to come back and look at code that you've written, and you have to understand how it works and then change it. And so one really easy way to, uh, you know, to make code easier to understand is instead of using numbers in our code, instead of like writing code and sticking 13 or 52 in various places, um, to give those those things names, right? So if I write some code in a couple of days from now and I use the number 13 and I come back and look at it and I'm like 13, <laughs> where does 13 even come from? Um, however, num num ranks uh, is a much more you know it's a much more expressive way to write uh, that sort of thing. Yeah, so it's good good practice to avoid. Um, so-called magic numbers in code. And then finally, um, num villain hand is 1225. And this turns out to be n choose k, 50 choose 2. Basically, it's the number of different hand combinations that our opponent can have after our hand is fixed. Uh, and it just turns out that we'll, we'll need that number somewhere in the future. OK, so here, I've, here we've defined some numbers. Um, so these variables all have a value which is a number, uh, an integer in particular. So in, in Python and in a lot of programming languages, text data is sort of inherently different than numerical data. Uh, and those aren't the only types of things that we can have either. We can also have lists of things. So a list of anything is, is inherently different than just a number. So let's, uh, let's make some lists. So there's a few things that we'll find it useful to have lists of. Um, so we'll make a new list called suits, and it's going to contain string data. So it has a number of entries, each of which is a string, each of which is text. So the syntax, the way we write a list in Python, is with an open bracket, and then we just uh, you know list all the items separated by commas. Notice the suits. Uh, let's see, they're hearts, diamonds, clubs, and spades. Make a list of ranks. So ranks are, let's see, ace, king, and so on. Um, as you may have noticed, strings go in. Strings go in uh, quotes. I know it takes a little while for me to type all this in, but hopefully you're typing too. So it's not a big deal. Um, I mentioned previously, but I really do want to go slowly, make sure I cross all the T's and dot all the I's, so apologies if you actually have a programming background, but I think it's for the best. Okay, so I've made a list of all the ranks, um, all the suits, and finally uh, I want to make a list of all the cards. Okay, so it's going to be convenient convenient for us. Uh, you know, So we noticed, we noted when we looked at this poker eval documentation, um, there's already sort of, sort of an order that they use for the cards. Uh, and we're going to order our cards, our list of cards, in the same way. Um, and that'll make some things that we do uh, a little more convenient later. Okay, so cards equals open bracket. Let's see if I can do this fast. Well, okay, let's just let's just get to it. Deuce of hearts, three of hearts, four of hearts. Uh, do they use a T? Yeah, they use a T, not right 10. Queen, King. Okay, and I can copy and paste to make this a little less painful. Diamond Club Spade. Notice that you can 
put things on multiple lines. Um, when we get to the end of the first line, there's a comma, but no closing bracket, so Python knows that it should just keep looking on the next line for the rest of the array. Okay. So we've seen a few different kinds of data so far. Um, we've seen integers, we've seen strings, and now we've seen lists of uh, anything really. Okay, so we've defined these. I'm going to press Shift Enter to evaluate that cell. And now our IPython notebook knows what all those variables are. So for example, if I'm curious about the type of something, I can actually write something like type of num cards, and then I evaluate that and it tells me it's an integer. So int is short for integer. If I'm interested in the type of shoots, it tells me it's a list. And it is, so that's great. So let's say a little bit more about working with lists. In particular, we're going to be interested in accessing their elements. Um, so if I want to access an element of suits, what I do is I type suits, and then square brackets, um, just like this opening bracket, and then a number, 1. I evaluate that, and it says D. So this is the, uh, in some sense, the, the one-th or the first element. Um, However, it turns out that lists in Python are starting with, with 0. So h is the 0th element, d is the 1th element, c is the 2nd, the 2th the element, and so on. So that's something you just have to get used to. If I want to see an h, I have to type 0 there. Okay. So I mentioned that if we want to write down a hand or a board for poker eval, essentially it's going to be a list of cards. So we just saw how to do lists here, um, and we can make a list of cards pretty easily. So let's say, uh, say hand as strings, um, and let's uh, write a list of cards. Let's say um, ace, ace, jack, offsuit, and I can write a board in the same way. Um, make a variable called board as strings with a list of a list of strings, eight of diamonds, six of spades, three of hearts, something like that. Let's say king of diamonds and then a blank. Okay, so there's two things to notice here. First, um, I name these variables hand as strings and board as strings. So if you remember, when we looked in the poker eval documentation, it said that we could designate uh, a card, you know, so each member of the list, and a hand again is a list of cards. So each member of the list, uh, so each member represents one card. And it can be either a number or a string, right? So we can use strings like 2h, or we can use a number like 0. Okay, so for most of what we do today, or in this video series, we're actually going to be representing hands and boards as a list of numbers and not a list of strings. There's some, um, basically, it's, it's faster for computers to work with numbers than, than text. So that's, that's the primary reason we're going to be working with numbers. So I name these variables hand as strings and board as strings in order to contrast with what we're usually going to be doing, which is working with lists of numbers. The other thing to notice is that I I did this uh, underscore underscore for the last card, and you know we didn't look at this the first time we looked at the documentation, but that's mentioned right here. It says the string underscore underscore or the number 255 are placeholders, meaning that the card is unknown. Okay, so this is a this is a hold on board. Hold on boards have five cards, but the last one here is unknown. So basically, this means uh, well, this board would be this could be a, the case if we were on the turn, right? Because we're on the turn, then the river has yet to be dealt, so it's unknown. Okay, so let's evaluate that cell. And now IPython knows about those two two lists. Okay, so it turns out that poker eval gives us a way to convert between hands that are written as list of strings and hands that are written as a uh, list of numbers. So the way we do that is we write PE uh, and remember PE is just short for poker eval dot poker eval. So I can write PE dot string to card. And let's look at the documentation. So question mark. Um, PE dot string to card not found. 
Um, okay, great. So I, I guess I had forgotten to run, to run that line up there. But now I've now I've run that line, and it knows what P is. So now we can say P dot string to card question mark, and it pops up some documentation for the function. So the purpose of this function is to convert card names or strings to card numbers, integers, according to this map, which we've already looked at. So it says the uh, cards argument may either be a list or a string, right? So it can be either a list of cards or it can be a string which represents a particular card. Okay, so let's use it. So if we run p dot string to card on uh, hand as strings, then we expect to get back a list of numbers. The first of number should be ace of hearts, which uh, is a 12, and the second the jack of diamonds corresponds to 22. So we expect to get back a list that has two numbers, uh, 12 and 22. And indeed we do. Great. All right. Let me just write some, some comments here for good measure. We can describe hands um, or the board as a list of strings. Uh, where double underscore represents an unknown card. We can also give each card a number and describe a hand or a board as a list of numbers. Alright, okay. So we can say hand equals the numerical version of hand as strings. And similarly, I'm going to say board is PE dot string to card. And a convenient thing about IPython is that I type the, the first couple letters of something and then I press the tab button, it'll complete it for me. So you know, that'll make your life a little bit easier. Okay, so our convention in pretty much all of the code that we're going to write um, in this video, our, our convention is to always work with the numerical representation of hands and boards. So, uh, in particular, that's going to involve, you know, when we need to use strings, um, you know, sometimes we will, sometimes we want to output uh, a string version that, that humans can look at. Um, so whenever we need to do that, we'll use the, uh, the card to string function of PE, and we're going to convert to strings at the last minute whenever it's necessary. So generally our um, hands and boards will be represented as numbers, and we need to convert, we'll do that at the last second, sort of right when we need to print it out. And so we don't get confused um, will indicate the stringness, the fact that we're working with strings instead of numbers, in the variable name whenever we whenever we do that. So, you know, whenever we want to, uh, you know, manually input um, some cards, uh, a hand or a board, um, using the string version, we'll need to convert it to, uh, to you know, the numerical version um, with this function string to card. And the other thing I want to just point out at this point um, is just notice that, oh man, <laughs> okay, so notice that, notice that cards um, run from 0 to 51. So again, there's 52 cards, but lists of things uh, in a particular numerical representation here, um, they start at 0. So we go from 0 to 51 and not from 1 to 52, uh, while the empty card gets the number 255. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, string to card here is a function 
And what a function does is it takes some input. In this case, it takes, uh, we've given it hand as strings. That's a list of strings. And it returns some output. So we saw here that it returns a list of numbers and that we use the equal sign to store that list of numbers into the variable hand. So it's often going to be useful to write our own functions. So basically, what we need to do is we need to tell the computer what the function will take as inputs and then uh, you know what it's going to give as an output. Okay. So the way we do that is as follows. We're going to say something like def my function open parentheses a and b colon. So def is short for define. So we're going to define a new thing. We're calling it my function. Uh, you know this can be anything you want. You should choose it to be descriptive. And we're going to say it takes as input two variables, um, a and b here. You can call it whatever you want. But again, you should be descriptive, and then a colon, and then a press enter. So then I'm going to do some work. And then at some point, I'm going to type return, and then tell it what the output should be. So again, a function basically takes input and produces output. So the inputs go in parentheses after the function name in, after, in this define statement and the outputs go in this return statement. So I might do some work. Uh, for example, you know, var new variable, call it whatever you want, equals a plus b, and then I can return new variable. So if I evaluate this cell, shift enter, uh, then IPython now knows about a new function called my function that takes two numbers, or two variables, um, two things, a and b, and then when you call it, it's going to make a new variable that is the sum of those two things, and it's going to return that new variable. So a simple example, but let's give it a try. So now if I write my function, open parentheses 2, 3, and I run it, then 2 and 3, um, so this 2 is mapped to the A, 3 is mapped to the B, and then this code will execute and it will return new variable as the output and we should expect to see a 5. Okay, 5, excellent. Great, so now that we know what functions are, let's write one that's useful. Okay, let's get rid of that. So something that's going to be useful, now that we know what cards are, it's, it's going to be useful to be able to look at two cards, um, two lists of cards, so that is either two hands or a hand on the board, and tell if those hands or boards conflict. That is, if they contain the same card in them. Right? So if I have ace of hearts, jack of diamonds, and ace of hearts, two of diamonds, then those two hands conflict. Right? It can't be the case that one player has uh, ace of hearts, jack of diamonds, and another player has ace of hearts, two of diamonds, because there's only one ace of hearts in the deck. Right? So it turns out um, that we're often going to want to know if um, two hands or a board in a hand uh, conflict in, in this way. So let's define a function that is going to tell us that. So we're going to call it conflicts. It's, let's see, it's going to take as input um, two lists of cards. We'll call them cards one, cards two. Okay. And so this function is going to check if any of the cards in the first list are the same as any card in the second list. So we're going to learn a few new things when we write this function. So let's be sure to document all of them. OK, so let's write our own function, exclamation point. So yeah, so it'll be useful, uh, useful to have a function that takes so when I say a function takes something, I, I mean that that's, that's its input. So this function takes as input two lists of cards and tells us if the two lists overlap at all. To do this, uh, you know, to do this, essentially what we want to do is we want to look at every card in the first list and every card in the second list and compare them. And if there's a match ever, um, then the two lists conflict, and otherwise they don't. So to do this, we'll need to look at every pair of cards, where one 
you know, where one comes from the first list and one comes from the second list. And then we'll check if they're equal. All right. So whenever we write a function, it turns out to be good function to make explicit what that function takes as input, what it expects, and then what it produces as output. So in the future, when we want to know what the function does, instead of just reading all the code that it might take to write that function, we can just look at the comments at the beginning and it should tell us everything we need to know about the function. So doing a good job writing a function, you know, we shouldn't need to know exactly how a function works to do what it does. Um, we should just know what it does. Okay, so this function will take as input cards one and cards two, which are a list of cards represented by numbers. So that's what this function expects to get as input. As output, um, it turns out that our output is going to be either true or false. Um, it's going to be true uh, if the lists conflict and false otherwise. So we actually haven't seen true and false before. Um, I mentioned that there's numerical data and there's string data and there's lists. There's also these uh, true and false, which are uh, sort of a special type of data in and of, their, in and of themselves, known as booleans. Um, so a, a piece of boolean data is either true or false, and it's used to represent, um, you know, true or false sorts of sorts of information. We'll see an example of that in a second. The other thing we need to learn about before we do this is a way to look at every element of a list and, and do something with it. Okay, so the way we're going to do that is by using what's called a for loop. So if we want to look at every entry in a list, you know, so we have some lists, let's just work with it. So this is a list, so this list right here. And if we want to, suppose we want to do something for every element in that list. We want to do something for every element in that list. <laughs> the way we express that is with what's called a for loop. Basically what that means is we're going to do something for every element in that list. So we do that by writing something like 4s in suits and then a colon and then we'll do something very simple which is print s. So we execute that and we can see that it prints out um, hdcs. So what this is doing is that this line right here, print s inside, it's called inside the for loop, it's being executed four times. It's being executed for every element in the suits. So every element, for every time it's uh, executed, every time that print statement is executed, the s variable has a different value. It has a value which is one of the elements in suits. So the first time that print statement is executed, the s has the value of the first element in the list. The second time it's executed, it has the value of the second element in the list, and so on. So this is useful in, in tons of situations. So in particular, in our conflicts function, we're going to want to do something for every element of cards 1. For every element of cards 1, we're going to want to look at every element of card 2 and see if they match. So in this case, we're actually going to use two for loops. We're going to say for every element in card one, so I'll say for i in card one, so for every single element in card one, we're going to want to look at every single element in card two, so for j in cards two. So this is called, this is called nesting for loops. Um, so basically, when, this, um, when the first for loop executes, um, i will have the value, which is some element of cards one, and then the second loop, will execute where j has the uh, value of some element of card 2 and then we want to check if they're equal so that's easy we say if i equals j so i again is uh, the value of some element of card 1 j is uh, some element of card 2 and we want to check if they're equal remember earlier that I said that a single equal sign indicates assignment uh, and that a different operator indicates a check for equality so um, that second operator is the double equal sign. Okay, so for here I've typed double equals, and that's a test for equality. Okay, so what happens if we have a card from list one and a card from list two, and they're equal? 
Well, then we know that the result of our function um, should be true because that means the lists do conflict. So in that case, we'll return true. However, if we make it through this whole, well, if we make it through both lists and we still haven't found a match, then we know that they don't conflict. So then we'll type uh, return false and save. Okay, so the big picture here is that we look for it every uh, every L, every card in the first list and every card in the second list, if they match, will return true. Otherwise, if we make it through that whole that whole process and we haven't found a match yet, then finally we we know that we can return false. There's there's no conflict. Another thing to know about Python, and let me just let me just make some notes here, uh, is that indentation matters. Um, so you know that I've uh, so inside this for loop, I've indented each successive line. Um, essentially, the code would mean different things if I if I wrote the indentation differently. Um, so the fact that um, that second for loop and everything inside it is indented with respect to the top for loop means that all that stuff, those middle three lines, uh, all of that is happening for every value of line. Um, so this is this is unlike some other programming languages where um, you know indentation or other white space doesn't matter, but in Python it does. I should also mention that it's a uh, it's good practice to document the inputs and outputs of functions. Um, it really really may not seem like it now, but it will make your life so much easier in the future. Um, I promise. You know, you know, it's also a, it's a good way to organize your thoughts before you start to write a function. Um, you know, you write down exactly what it should do. Okay, so I talked about, let's see, I talked about if statements. I talked about equality and returning, returning. Um, you know, I don't know that I talked about if statements in particular, but it does pretty much what it says it does. So it says if, um, and then some condition. So if i equals j. So if that's true. So if i equals j is true then this next line will execute. Uh, if that if that condition is not true, if i is not equal to j, then that, then that next line will not execute. Right? So this is called a conditional statement. Right? The next line will execute only on the condition that i equals j. Okay, so now it turns out that there's sort of one other detail that we want to take into account here. I, I mentioned earlier that we have lists of cards um, then sometimes we could have, you know, like text underscore underscore or the number 255 when we want to uh, indicate the, the empty card essentially. Okay, so here, if both of these lists of cards contain the empty card, then this thing i equals j would be true at some, uh, you know, for those empty cards. And, and so this function will return true that the list conflict. And that's not really want the behavior that we want, right? So let me just add a note. We don't return true if you know we find uh, a match for the empty card in, in both lists. And that's 255, given our, our representation of, of cards. Um, so how can we change our function to express that? Well, it turns out that the you know the numerical representation of the uh, of the empty card is 255 whereas real cards only go from 0 up to 51. So we can skip the empty card uh, because the value is different, the value is higher. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say if i equals j and something else is true and i is less than num cards then we're going to return to. So what this says is that if i is equal to j and i is a real card, that is say i um, has a value between 0 and 51 because num cards is 52, then we'll return true. Otherwise, we'll return false. Great. So let's give this a try. Let's give it a test. Let's make sure I execute that statement so that Python knows about it. And then we can run conflicts and give it a couple lists of cards. Let's say hand and board. So we defined hand and board previously up, up there. Um, hand is a star jack of diamonds. 
and board is eight six three king. So there not, should not be any conflict between these between these boards, and it should say false, and it does. There's no conflict. On the other hand, if I wrote conflicts uh, hand with some other board. So what's a hand that would conflict with the boards that we can we can test that out real quick? Three of hearts. So let's say ace of hearts, three of hearts. That should conflict with the board. Ace of hearts, three of hearts. However, remember that this function expects to get lists of numbers as inputs. Um, so in particular, if we just run this as it is, um, it says false. The reason it says false is that it'll never be the case that some number and board is equal to some string in that list of strings, right? So if we pa if we pass in one list of card as a list of numbers and one list as a list of strings, uh, it's never going to find that they're equal, right? Because a number is never equal to a string. So that's that's incorrect behavior. And so this is a good example of why we need to be consistent about how we we represent um, all of our list of cards. We're going to use list of numbers all the way around. Okay, so here we're going to convert to list of numbers first with the PE dot string to card function. Okay, so now uh, you know the string to card function will evaluate first, and so that whole thing there will evaluate to list of numbers, and then we call conflicts. It'll get two lists of numbers, and it'll say true. The uh, list do conflict. Okay. So again, we've run conflicts twice here, um, but only the output of the last one was printed. Um, but if we're interested in seeing both of them, we can um, tell it explicitly to print with the print function. So I'm going to write print and then put in parentheses the thing I want to print. And it says false true. The, the first is false and the second is true. Great. It's worth noting that the conflicts function is globally accessible. So what, what I mean by that is that, you know, since I've just sort of defined that function in a block and just made it available, um, essentially I've made it available to everything we're going to do in the future. You know, that, that may or may not be desirable. Um, you know, maybe in the future uh, I want to consider whether other things conflict. I want to consider whether people conflict in some, some game I'm writing, right? Um, and then I might want to define a new function called conflicts that looks at two players in the game or something. I, I don't know. Anyway, it's sort of it's sort of bad organizational practice to define globally accessible functions like this. Um, however, it does make things more convenient sometimes, um, and we're we're kind of taking a, a quick and dirty approach here, so we won't we won't worry about it too much. Okay, so this is sort of a, a quick and dirty approach to some things. Great. So I'm going to wrap up this video here. It's uh, kind of a bit long, I think, but you know I hope everything's made sense. Let me just review everything we've seen so far. So we started out by importing some libraries, some, some functionality. In particular, we've made use of this poker eval library, and we'll continue to make use of it. And in fact, we'll be writing it so much that it's you know, rather than typing that whole thing every time we use it, we're going to assign that object to uh, PE. We can access documentation in an IPython with question mark. We can define some useful variables. We'll give them names. So here's some, for example. Um, and these all have integer values. And then suit strings and cards are all lists of strings. And again, a string is, is just text inside quotes. Uh, we can describe, you know, hands or boards as lists of strings or numbers, and we're generally going to be working with lists of numbers. If we want to convert between strings and numbers, we can use pe.string to card, or pe.card to string if we want to go in the reverse direction. Finally, we wrote our own function, um, and this function, um, although it's pretty simple, it demonstrates a lot of really, really important concepts in programming. Right, so. A function takes inputs, uh, in this case two lists of cards, which we've called card1 and card2, and it gives an output. In this case, the output is uh, either true or false. 
So whenever we want to define a function, we use the, the def keyword, and then we give the name of the function, and then we give a list of arguments in parentheses. Whenever we run this function, um, such as right here, the first argument is associated with the first argument in the, in the argument list, and the second argument we give it is associated with the second in the argument list, and then the code executes. To, when we implemented this function, we learned about uh, for loops, and we learned about conditional statements. So what a for loop does is it does something for every element in a list. So for every element of cars 1, we're going we're gonna to call that element i, and then execute everything else. So what does that stuff do? For every element of card 2, we're going to call it j, and then we're going to execute the rest of the stuff. So what does that stuff do? Well, it compares i and j, and it also uh, does a check on the value of i. And so if uh, i and j are equal, and i is less than num cards, which, which means that j is also less than num cards, of course. So if both of those things are true, then we can conclude that the two lists conflict and return true. However, if we've all checked all, all pairs of cards that way and still haven't found a conflict, uh, then we'll get to this return false statement and we'll return false. You know, and we, we checked that at, at least in the case of two examples that this conflict function does what we expect it to do. Great, so uh, please make sure you understand that before moving on. I hope it was all clear. Uh, let me know if you have any questions and otherwise, good luck at the tables. All right, bye.